Hi, I'm Dr. Gregory Davis, gynecologist in Chico. Thanks for joining me. We're now in the second segment talking about endometriosis diagnosis and uh, some treatments here. In the first segment, we talked about how endometriosis comes about and some of the symptoms related to that. In this segment, we're going to be talking about the diagnosis and diagnosis of endometriosis can only be made with laparoscopy. Now, let me back up and say that if I'm doing an ultrasound, if you're coming to see me and I've got an hour-long appointment to see you to evaluate you, when I do your exam and I do an ultrasound, when I do the vaginal ultrasound, I'm looking at the wall of the uterus. And if you tell me that, man, my periods are just super painful and heavy bleeding, and that's one of the other symptoms that can occur, is that I didn't mention it so much in the first segment, but there can be some very heavy bleeding. So somebody, if you tell me that man, I've got midline pain, severe cramping, severe bleeding, then when I do the ultrasound, I'm taking a look to see if there's any endometriosis in the wall of the uterus, and we call that adenomyosis. thing to remember is just it's in the wrong place, and it's in the wall of the uterus. So your uterus is a big muscle, so every month when you have a contraction and that muscle's contracting, you can imagine if you've got something you know, buried in your bicep that's bleeding and releasing prostaglandins, which is causing nausea, vomiting, bloating, diarrhea, and cramping, your, your muscle's going to hurt every time you flex it. Same thing happens in the uterus. When that uterus is trying to contract, it just creates tremendous amount of pain. And adenomyosis, that, that endometriosis in the wall of the uterus, if it's just beneath the surface, when you slough that lining and you're trying to put down a new layer of carpet, your uterus is, with your estrogen coming on is trying to put down a new layer of carpet, that adenomyosis below the surface makes the surface non-sticky. And the, and the lining can't stick, so it just keeps bleeding. That's why ladies that have adenomyosis will have prolonged bleeding with their periods. So when I do an ultrasound and I take a look, I can see in the wall of the uterus these little dark areas. And if somebody has a history that's painful periods, midline pain, lots of heavy bleeding, the uterus is tender with the vaginal probe, and I see that on ultrasound, yes, I will put down on their chart that that's adenomyosis. We don't make the diagnosis until we do uh, laparoscopy. Now, as we talked about in the first segment, if you've got progressively worsening pain with your periods, if you're missing school on a regular basis or missing work because of your painful periods, or you're having pain with bowel movements, you know, or you're having problems with infertility, or you've had uh, uh, bloating and pain mid-cycle, you know, and we're, you're coming to see me and you finally decide, you know what, I really want to find out what's going on, well, then what we're going to need to do is do a laparoscopy. Now, it's really important if you're going to see somebody to take care of you for endometriosis and they're going to go and look inside with laparoscopy, you really want to make sure that you have a gynecologist that really specializes in endometriosis because you don't want you want not only the diagnosis, which is what laparoscopy is going to do, but you'll want us or whoever's taking care of you to treat your endometriosis while we're there. And the treatment for that is to surgically excise it at the time we're there. Now, it's important, if you're going to find somebody to take care of your endometriosis, I would recommend you go on the Endometriosis Association, their website. They have a great website. It lists all the physicians in your area. You can type in your zip code or, or, or uh, city, and they'll show you the people that are registered with the Endometriosis Association. And usually those people are going to be people that are, are surgeons that are good at uh, taking care of endometriosis. Typically, you want to go to somebody that's doing a lot of endometriosis cases. You want to go to somebody who's doing at least between 80 and 100 cases a year of endometriosis. That tells you that this, they have a lot of experience taking care of it. And the other thing is, is that you will want somebody that's going to take care of you after the surgery too because you, know, you may have some ongoing uh, problems. But let's talk about what happens at the time of surgery. At laparoscopy, what we do, and I'll tell you what I do at my surgery center, when you're coming to my surgery center for laparoscopy and we sign a consent in the office, and that's the other thing, is that uh, we're going to have a YouTube video on the consent form. Uh, I mentioned it uh, on the hysterectomy. You can check that uh, YouTube. But you should sign a consent, and on that consent, the consent should say why you're doing the surgery. Well, you've been having painful periods, think you have endometriosis. What's the benefit? What are you going to do? Well, hopefully you're going to remove the endometriosis at the time you're there. 
What are the alternatives? Well, you don't really have a lot of alternatives, no other way to really diagnose it. But you need to understand that there can be some problems associated with that. And so there can be a risk. If you've had lots of abdominal surgeries, you've had big up and down incision for an unusual type of C-section for twins, or you've had a bowel resection, or you've had lots of abdominal surgery, well, you need to let your surgeon know that because that may make your surgery a little bit more complicated. So the laparoscopic surgery means that what we're going to be doing, it's an outpatient surgery, and so what I do at my surgery center is that my anesthesiologist, before you go to sleep, will put in a spinal medicine and I know you're going, wait a second, why are you putting a spinal in me? Well, you're still going to be asleep, but the spinal is going to take away your pain from here on down. Back in the days when I started doing uh, endometriosis surgery over 20 years ago, we didn't do that. And the patients woke up and we were taking out all this endometriosis and they had a lot of pain. And unfortunately, you know, it's no fun when you wake up and you have a lot of pain. And if I'm doing surgery on teenagers, and you know they may have to have surgery again sometime in their life. And if the first surgery is painful, then that's a real scary thing to have to go back and have a second surgery. So starting in about 1996, 97, uh, our anesthesiologist started doing spinals, and they put in some medicine that blocked all the pain from here on down, from the waist on down. And it used to last for just a couple hours. Well, now we've perfected it, and our anesthesiologist will put medicine in that lasts for up to 24 hours, sometimes 36 hours. So the benefit for you is that you're not feeling any pain during the surgery. The other thing is, is that your brain is kept asleep from the general anesthetic, but your body still feels pain, and so they have, anesthesiologists have to give you narcotics. And so when you wake up, you're going to be nauseated from all this narcotics. But if, if you've got a spinal working and you're not having any pain, you're not feeling any pain, they don't have to give any narcotics. So that's huge. That's really important. So if you wake up in the recovery room and you have no nausea and you have no pain, then we just hit a home run. So my goal for you when I do the surgery is to make sure when you wake up you have no pain. So what do I do besides the spinal and besides the general anesthetic? We tilt your head kind of downhill, so your head's tilted downhill, so your bowels kind of move up and out of the pelvis. Then I make a little 5 millimeter incision down in your belly button. We lift up on your abdomen, make a little incision. We put the scope down inside. We use a little instrument to kind of go inside. We put the scope in, and we immediately look, put in carbon dioxide, and then I'm immediately looking in there, and I'm saying, okay, now that we've distended your tummy, then I'm putting another little incision down near the pubic hair, and then frequently I'll put one by each hip. So you're going to have four five millimeter incisions. Now, at our surgery center, we have these high definition 1080p unbelievable cameras and system and setup. So the lights are off. Everybody in the operating room is watching what we're doing. And so when I do surgery, I have the same scrub, same circulator, same three anesthesiologists that rotate through. So we have the same team. So as soon as we pop the scope in, my, my scrub tech and my circulator are immediately looking to see if we need any special instruments depending on where your endometriosis is. So when I look inside, first thing I do is I look down, we're looking down towards your feet. So your legs are in the exam position. So I'm looking down, I'll look at the back of the bladder, I look at the front and the back of the uterus, I look at the left tube and ovary, right tube and ovary, left side of the pelvis, right side of the pelvis, I look down in the cul-de-sac area where the rectum is, Swing the camera over, look at your appendix, look up at your liver, look at the gallbladder. So I'm, I'm taking a cruise around the neighborhood to make sure everything, there's no endometriosis there. And once I do that, then the first thing I do is I say, okay, do you have endometriosis? And I, if we go, yes, she's got endometriosis, then we start photographing it. And then we classify it. Is it minimal? Is it mild? Is it moderate? Is it severe? Is it extensive? based on this complex scoring system. Not based on pain, but based on what we see inside. So once we document that with photos, so we're going to make a copy, you'll have a copy, I'll keep a copy, and then they'll, uh, the surgery center keeps a copy. So now I look inside, and then what I do is that I say, okay, where am I going to go after these implants? Now, there's a couple of ways to treat endometriosis implants. And for years, we used to cauterize that. So just think of a, an endometriosis implant as just like a mole on your, on your skin here. If I come in and I zap that, 
you know, your dermatologist may zap some of the lesions or they freeze it. Well, that's what we used to do with cautery. But the problem is, what happens when you have an endometriosis implant and it's sitting right over the ureter? That's a delicate little tube that comes from your kidneys down to your bladder. Well, it's not a good idea to burn that or to laser that because you may damage the ureter underneath. Or what if it's sitting over a large blood vessel? If it's sitting over the iliac artery or vein, you certainly don't want to be zapping that because you may cause some serious bleeding. So, several, back in about 1994, there's several doctors that pioneered surgically resecting endometriosis. And since that time, it's been uh, perfected. And what I do is that I put in a little instrument that has some saline that's under pressure, and I got a little teeny tube. So it's just a little, it's a little pointed tube where the saline comes out and it's under pressure. So the way to think about your peritoneum on the inside of your abdomen is that your peritoneum is kind of like your fitted sheet on your mattress at home. Your, it, your inks, those little teeny implants are kind of like ink stains in your fitted sheet. So they're in that peritoneum. Now the peritoneum, if I grab hold of that peritoneum and lift up, it kind of pops back into, snaps back into place. Well, just like your ink stain on your fitted sheet, if you lift up on it, it's going to snap back into place. So when I see those implants, which are like ink stains in your fitted sheet, then I, I take a little instrument, I lift that up, and then I cut a little teeny hole in that fitted sheet. I take my little little instrument, put down in there, pump in some saline, or sometimes I'll put some numbing medicine in there, and poof, I just puff up, and that ink stain just kind of gets puffed up. So now it's separated from the tissues underneath. So if you've got your ureter setting here, and I'm going to need to take an implant right off the per peritoneum over that, I will grab the peritoneum, grasp it just above there, make a hole, and as I pump in that saline, it just goes poof, and the, the whole peritoneum, that whole fitted sheet just lifts off, and now I've got this protective layer of normal saline there, so I can cut that implant out and not do any damage to the ureter or to the iliac artery or vein or any of those big blood vessels. So when I go, I, I surgically remove that. Now, why am I removing that? Because remember, each one of those little implants makes prostaglandins. So if I remove all those little areas of prostaglandins in your, your bloating, your cramping, your nausea, your vomiting, all of that's going to go away or, or, or go down drastically. So the key to success with laparoscopic surgery is, is making the diagnosis and then surgically excising everything that you can possibly excise at the time you're there. Now, the other thing we find is we sometimes find adhesions. And you go, well, what are adhesions? Well, it's the same thing as scar tissue. Now, how does that occur in your abdomen? Well, what happens is that your peritoneum is, is beautifully designed and it's nice, delicate, moist, and nothing is supposed to stick. Your bowels, you know, your small bowel, large bowel, everything just kind of slides on each other. But when you've got these little endometriosis implants and they're bleeding and they're releasing prostaglandins, then things get stuck together. So if your tube sticks to the side of the pelvis or your ovary, when you have two normal tissues get stuck together, that's called an adhesion. So adhesions can be, I, I kind of, this may sound crazy, but I kind of think of it as, you know, when you're pulling your piece of pizza out of the rest of the, the big piece of pizza, you got these little strings of mozzarella cheese that you have to cut or break. Those are like adhesions. They can be long, they can be short, they can be thick, they can be thin, they can be round, they can be flat, they can even have blood vessels going through them if they've been there for years. So adhesions are an abnormal attachment of two pieces of tissue in your abdomen. So when I see that, if your ovary stuck to the side of the pelvis or your tube stuck there, well, I've got to free that up. I've got to get it back to normal. Now, you may say, well, wait a second. You're going around in my peritoneum. You're cutting all these holes. Now, what happens to those afterwards? Well, that's a good question. Your skin on your outside here, when we take off a little lesion on your skin, you know, it takes a couple of weeks for it completely heals. Inside, it heals in 72 hours. So... The important thing to remember is that if you've got all these little raw areas where we've made these little microscopic incisions and removed that tissue, you've got to stay active for the first 72 hours after surgery. So I do most of my surgeries like this on Fridays. So I tell my patients, you know, Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, you've got to take your pain medicine if they need it. Hopefully they won't need much. But you've got to take your pain medicine. You've got to stay active. You've got to go out to eat Friday night. You've got to go to the movies. You've got to do something. Stay active. If you're staying active throughout that weekend, 
you're not going to get adhesions. But if you go home and be tough and don't take your pain medicine and try not to move, yep, everything's going to get stuck. And then you'll have a lot more adhesions. So the key thing is just make sure when you go home that you stay active. So I have my patients on Friday night set their alarm when they go to bed, wake up about three hours later to go to the bathroom, walk around a little bit, just that one time that night, same thing Saturday night. And that gives them an opportunity to just keep things moving. When you wake up in bed, you turn from side to side so that things don't get stuck. So the key to success is making the diagnosis and then getting the treatment started with removing those implants. Now, what are some of the other treatments? Well, traditionally we've used birth control pills and how do birth control pills work? Well, birth control pills keep you from ovulating. So instead of making all this estrogen every month in the mid-cycle, you're just getting a constant dose of estrogen. If you get that constant dose of estrogen, then you're not making as much estrogen, so you're not feeding those endometriosis implants. So birth control pills work, but usually you gotta take them continuously. When you get to the end of that pack of pills, instead of having a period, you chuck the pack, you start a new pack, and you just keep going. So we'd like to have you take them continuously. Other thing is, what are non NSAI, non steroidal anti-inflammatories? That's Motrin, Advil, Aleve, Ibuprofen, Naproxen, Anaprox, all of those things. There's a whole bunch of different anti-inflammatories, but taking those, what do they do? They block the release of prostaglandins. Now, we talked about how prostaglandins cause all these things. So if all of your pain occurs with your period, and you know your period's going to start tomorrow or the next day, you got to start your non steroidal inflammatories. I would recommend you start 12 or 24 hours ahead of time. Because if you take that non steroidal and you block all of those prostaglandin uh, uh, areas, those little implants that are going to release prostaglandins, then they work a whole lot better. You'll have less cramping, and amazingly enough, you'll have less bleeding. But if you wait till your period starts, and you're in the midst of all this pain, it's too late. You missed the boat. Taking those, they're not going to work nearly as well. Now, the other thing is there's some medicines called Lupron and Zolodex, and these are medicines that kind of put you into false menopause. And they've been around for 20 years, and, and they do work well because they take your estrogen level down to practically zero, so it's like you're in menopause. Well, what happens? Well, you have hot flashes, you don't sleep so well, but the one thing is they discovered that you can get some bone loss because just like in menopause, you can lose bone. Same thing can happen here. So if somebody puts you on Zolodex or Lupron, and Lupron is a, uh, an injection you get, I would recommend the monthly instead of the three-month injection because if you react or don't do well on it, then you can bail out at the end of a month rather than waiting three months. The Zolodex is a little, uh, little pellet that's implanted in your belly button, and that's, that's really not a painful thing. That works well. And it, I think you get a little better distribution with that. Uh, but the thing is, these are only approved for six months. These are very expensive. They may be as much as $500 a month. And so what happens at the end of six months? Well, you're going to have to go off of those. And by the way, while you're on those, since they drop your estrogen down to, to zero, we add back, so we do something called ABT, add back therapy, should be given to you while you're on that because that adds your estrogen back a little bit so that you don't lose bone mass, you don't have as many symptoms, but it doesn't have changed the effectiveness or the success of the treatment. But you know what? About six years ago, I went to a conference and they were talking about using the marine IUD because the marine IUD secretes progesterone right where we want it, right into the uterus, right into the wall of the uterus. And that's where all the problem is with endometriosis and cramping and bleeding. And a large percentage of ladies that have the marine IUD don't have a period. And so that's a great thing. So they did studies and they compared Zolodex and Lupron with the marine IUD. They had the same effectiveness when they did surgery and looked at them six months later. Well the marine IUD is going to be a whole lot more cost effective because it's a $500 one-time thing and it's going to last for five years. So you got five years with the IUD. So what I do for my patients is that when I do laparoscopy and I look in and see that they have endometriosis, and we've talked about this ahead of time, I recommend putting in the marine, marine IUD while they're under anesthesia. So we put that IUD in right there in the operating room so that starts to work right after the surgery. Now, the interesting thing with the marine IUD is that if 
if you're a person uh, really and you're thin, normal body size or thin, then there's about a 90% chance you're not going to have periods for the five years while you have that. If you have a, a little heavier and have a little more fatty tissues, your fatty tissues make a little bit of estrogen, and so that estrogen is kind of counteracting some of the progesterone, so there's, you may have a little higher chance of having some periods. But I guarantee you, all ladies are going to usually have a decreased cramping and decreased bleeding. And, and after I started doing this about six years ago, this works way better than taking that. In fact, I, I can't remember the last time I've actually used those. So to me, the IUD works. Now, I've actually put this marine IUD in, in a 12-year-old. Well, this is a young lady who had severe endometriosis. She had all kinds of problems, lots of adhesions and things, but she was having heavy bleeding. Well, putting that in did several things. Stopped her bleeding, stopped her cramping, didn't have her abdominal pain, and so she has done really well from an endometriosis uh, point of view. So the marine IUD is worthwhile putting that in. And now, I think with uh, the new health care plan, they're, they're asked that these are being covered by most insurances. Well, you may be using it for contraception, but it's also FDA approved for heavy bleeding. And so there's lots of ladies that have heavy bleeding. The final thing is, is progesterone injections. I definitely would not recommend doing that. You're going to feel, you're going to gain weight, you're going to have cramping, uh, you're going to have acne, oily skin. You're not going to be a happy camper on this. So I would really not do that. So the other thing is you may, have, you may need to be on some pain medications, and we kind of work with that. But hopefully if we're successful, we can get rid of your pain, we can get rid of that heavy bleeding, and you can get back to leading a normal life. I found out that since I started using the Marine IUD, I've had a lot less ladies coming back to need a second surgery three or four years later when the birth control pills or the Zolodex or Lupron don't work anymore. So it has actually been the best thing that we've found to treat the endometriosis long term.